Hello, uh, we're here with Congressman Denny Heck, who is running for Washington State Lieutenant Governor. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Sure, Nicole, thanks. Thanks for having me this evening. Very briefly, a little about myself. I'm a lifelong Washingtonian. When I was a small child, my biological father was getting up to go to work. It was payday and my mom said, don't you dare stop at the tavern and drink your paycheck. We are out of money and the cupboards are literally bare. Plus she knew he got kind of ornery when he was drinking. And he didn't come home. And my mom gathered myself up and my older brother borrowed money to take the bus back to Vancouver, Washington, got her job back at the telephone company as a telephone operator and walked, yes, two miles to work, to and from every day. There's a happy ending. My mom eventually married a good man who adopted my brother and me and brought another brother and sister into the picture. He was a lifelong card-carrying Teamster truck driver. And my mom was a CW, CWA member, uh, and they provided us with a good life. They owned their home, they had uh, annual vacations, a good union pension, and secure health care. And, and I took away from that experience two very important lessons. The first of which is people who are of modest means, people who are of humble means, people who are vulnerable need somebody to stand up for them. Whether it's a union, as in the case of my parents, or people in elective office who will fight for social justice, for economic justice, for racial justice. And the second lesson I learned is the importance of a strong public education. I am a passionate believer in good, strong public schools. I'm proud I'm the only candidate in this race not to take any money from private for profit charter schools. Those were my life, life lessons. And that's, and those are my values. And that's what I'll apply my next year as I'm Lieutenant Governor and fight for a just bus, but, well, a just budget and a fair budget that protects the vulnerable. And I hope in the course of this conversation, we can talk more specifically about some of the issues that I care about and what I will do with them. And I want you to know I will be honored with your support. I hope you will consider joining our effort and endorsing me and join the likes of Andrew Lewis and Sam Cho and Jeannie Cole Wells, who were a part of our effort to become the state's next Lieutenant Governor. How'd I do on time? Mm -hmm. You're on mute, Alice. There we go. I was just about to cut you off, but you're good. <laughs> oh, <laughs> perfect. So just time. a little bit over. <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, so Mackenzie has posted the uh, first question into the chat box. Uh, Brittany, would you like to go ahead with that one? Um, the responses to these are two minutes apiece. What would your priority policy areas be as Lieutenant Governor? Well, I think there are three areas that, uh, frankly, scream out for action. Uh, that have been overdue, obviously climate change. Uh, it's way past time for us to act and stop talking, stop giving it words, start giving it uh, action. Uh, I'm proud that I was the first member of the state's congressional delegation to sign on to Initiative 1631. I was the, one of the first members of the House of Representatives to sign on to H.R. 763, the Carbon Fee and Dividend Bill. Uh, secondly, and this has been a passion of mine since I entered the legislature, cleaning up Puget Sound. Uh, we co-founded and stood up the Puget Sound Recovery Caucus, that beautiful, magnificent body of water that defines us, is the engine of our recreation and our identity and our economy, frankly, is slowly but surely dying. And then second, and then lastly, uh, uh, economic recovery. We're in a hole and it's gonna be a while getting out of it. This is a bona fide crisis. It's gonna take experienced and steady hands to do that. And in this next session, we're gonna have a tough budget session. The last thing in the world we need is anybody that thinks that austerity budget is gonna help us. And the first thing we need is somebody who looks upon this as an opportunity to rebuild our economy in a way that is fairer for more people with more broadly shared prosperity and frankly uh, contemplates a kinder and gentler approach to Mother Earth. Those, were, those would be my top priorities. Great, thank you. Um, question two, Laura. This is a long one. If you win, there's a chance you might become governor if Jay Inslee is appointed to a post in the Biden administration. You'd well, let's get right to it, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's more. You'd also face a budget crisis due to the impact of the coronavirus. How would you deal with that budget crisis? Regressive ta taxation strains low and middle income families and reduced revenue collection curtails our ability to invest in vital infrastructure. 
Will you pledge to veto budget cuts to needed public services? What taxes would you look to raise in order to deal with this crisis? Well, thank you for the question. It's probably the most important question you could ask anybody running for the legislature or for the statewide executive offices. Uh, so first of all, as I indicated before, this is the last time that we should contemplate an austerity budget. Quite the opposite. 17% of our total workforce is with local or state government. And I know of no responsible economist who believes that we can recover our economy by slashing public sector budgets and laying people off. It is the opposite of what we should do, frankly. Uh, and additionally, I would say that it will not hurt if I'm still Lieutenant Governor and not Governor uh, to have another member of the state government team who is a former member of Congress, because the truth is the federal government is going to have to be a very active partner with us. State government has a limited number of tools uh, to solve these problems, and the federal government is able to assist. That's why I'm fighting right now for increased aid to local and state government and tribal governments. Uh, so with respect to the issue of taxation, I've walked the talk my entire career. I was walking the talk before it was popular. Uh, before it was easy to do. I was the prime sponsor when I was in the state legislature of an amendment to the Constitution to adopt an income tax as a member of the then Governor's Tax Advisory Council. And when I was Chief of Staff to Governor Gardner, we advanced uh, in the House of Representatives an income tax. We have the most regressive tax system in America. And absolutely, we seconds. should be look absolutely we should be looking for better, less regressive, more progressive ways uh, for taxation. I mentioned the income tax, a capital gains tax is also one that I think that we should adopt. I don't think people who make money off money should pay less in taxes than people who make money off of their labor. I didn't get a chance to answer the governor one, but we'll get to it. Great, thank you. Uh, question three, Lori. Congressman, do you support a just transition to deal with climate change, such as the Green New Deal, which would bring carbon emissions down to zero in the next decade or two, while investing in those most impacted, who are often low-income, marginalized communities of color? Absolutely support a just transition. That's why I'm attracted. Frankly, there are these different ways that we can do this. There's cap and trade, there's carbon fee and dividend, not always dividend. But I believe that when we adopt a carbon fee that we ought to make sure, and it was, by the way, it was why I was, uh, I took a couple of minutes to decide whether or not to get on HR 763, because I needed to make absolutely sure that uh, people of lower incomes were being held harmless, if not helped by the adoption of a carbon fee. And they are under that proposal. So absolutely, look, I, I don't think we should be having a conversation anymore about plans or goals. What we be, ought to have a conversation about is what specific and concrete action we can take that will make a difference. And I'll tell you, as some of you may recall, yesterday was the anniversary of the death of one of the great Americans from the Northwest, Billy Frake Jr., who was a hero and a dear friend of mine. A year after his passing, I went to the unveiling of his tombstone. They had a blanket over it. And they pulled it off. And what I read really struck me. Billy taught me his entire life. I was a friend of his for decades. And on his tombstone is written, we're running out of time. And we are running out of time with respect to climate change. So I'm not a big fan of plans. I'm a big fan of, big fan of action. And I know of no better way for us to reduce carbon pollution uh, than a carbon fee. And seconds. I will guarantee you that if we take the approach of a carbon fee, I will be front and center fighting to make sure that people in communities of color and lower income uh, brackets are held harmless if not helped by what we actually do. Great, thank you. Uh, question four, Mackenzie. Great, thank you. Uh, will you support efforts to combat the economic impacts of systematic racism by supporting policies that target inequality in areas like housing, education, and intergenerational wealth? Absolutely. My commitment is rock hard. It comes from my values. Uh, I also happen to have a family that is biracial. I've seen firsthand, I've not experienced it. I'm a white person of privilege, but I've seen firsthand the effects of racism. Uh, as, a, as a matter of evidence of this, a point of evidence, McKenzie, this isn't just rhetoric. Uh, I am a co-sponsor of the Reparations Commission Bill, 
uh, that was introduced in the United States House of Representatives. We have structural racism in this country and have had for a very long period of time. Uh, from my perch on the Financial Services Committee, we've been fortunate to be involved in a lot of efforts to protect people uh, against this form of racism. But what we should understand is if you're a person of color in this society, it's like the starting gun going off and you've got an 80 pound, back, uh, pound uh, backpack on you. And we're not going to ever level the playing field until we acknowledge that for what that is and take the actions necessary to level that playing field. I'm totally committed to it. Great, thank you. Uh, and now we'll open this up to questions, uh, follow-up questions from the board. There are, uh, the responses to these are one minute apiece. And uh, if you guys would raise your hand using the hand raise button or um, message me in the chat, I can uh, get you your question answered. Jason. Yes, Senator, thank you for your service. Um, could you uh, go over some of your uh, work with uh, education and the school systems and um, um, tell us a, a little bit about what you've done? Thank you, Jason. I'll put it to you very directly and bluntly. I am the education candidate in this race, period, full stop. My very first job while still in college was a member of the professional staff to the House Education Committee. After I was elected to the legislature, uh, I was made the co-chair of the Education Committee. Uh, indeed, uh, as it turns out, I also was a business agent for a classified public school employee union. Uh, and every night, to put it diplomatically, I lay my head down on a pillow with my wife of 44 years, who is a retired middle school uh, teacher and principal. 30 seconds. Let me assure let me assure you there's a special place in heaven for middle school teachers, special place in heaven for all teachers, but especially middle school teachers. Uh, this has been the defining value of my life, as I indicated at the outset. I even have written a book about education many years ago. Thank you. Uh, next up is Hannah. Hi. Um, first, Please thank your wife for uh, teaching all those years to children who are during the one period of their life when their brain does not develop. Uh, thank you and thank her. But um, next I was curious, you have had uh, long careers, you've indicated you've done a lot of things and held a lot of positions. I'm just kind of curious, what is it about Lieutenant Governor that drew you to this position? Um, I think uh, it is, uh, sort of an unsung role often. And I'm curious if there's like something about that position that you felt particularly strongly about. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, I guess a couple of three things. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd run my course in Congress, spending the last three years in a windowless room, three floors below the state or the nation's capital, conducting dozens of depositions uh, of witnesses relating to the Russian investigation and uh, the Ukraine scandal and leading and helping lead the house on impeachment kind of took its toll. Uh, so I decided it was time for me to come home. Nobody expected Cyrus to resign or to retire. 30 seconds. Uh, but when he, but well, this is one minute, right? Yes, I am extremely motivated for this job because I believe I have the right skill set. I have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours presiding over the state house and the US house. And I love the idea that the lieutenant governor has a bully pulpit and can color in the picture by prioritizing some of these things that I've been talking about at their own will. Great, thank you. Uh, Mackenzie. Sorry, I had to unmute myself there. Uh, so my question for you is, we live here in the 36 in a pretty progressive district. And um, there were a few times in your past that while, yes, you did vote to uh, eventually impeach uh, Donald Trump, uh, there were a few times where you actually voted not to, whereas uh, representatives like ours, like Jaya Paul, voted to move forward with that. So my question for you is, do you feel like you are more progressive than your opponents? And if so, could you give some examples of why? Yeah, I think I am actually the most progressive candidate in this race. And I think that is as a consequence of a career-long advocacy 
for progressive values. And I guess the way McKinsey, I would put that in perspective is some of the things that people are advocating today are pretty easy to advocate in the current political context. And I stood up and fought for them before it was easy. And I've already mentioned what I think should be exhibit A there. Let me tell you, in the mid 1980s, standing up for a state income tax was not easy. Uh, and I, I've never been afraid to stand up on behalf of people who, uh, who need people to advocate for them, as I said at the outset, uh, the vulnerable among us, and uh, to hold those values up. And I did it when it wasn't popular. Hey, thank you. Um, now I'm going to call on the LG uh, Phoenix Plus phone. I believe that's Liz. Hey there. Thank you, Nicole, for your incredible patience. I'm, I'm not sure why it suddenly has decided to call me the LG phone, but it is. <laughs> um, and I, I really have been wondering about, um, you know, part of what the lieutenant governor does is um, to preside over Senate meetings. And um, sometimes that is a good deal of maintaining civility. Um, and and making making sure that there's progress of the body in deliberations, um, and not always across the aisle is that an easy role to have to to deal with the two parties. And I'm wondering if coming from such a divided Congress has given you any insight as to how one would better preside over a body well that's such a good question thank you yes it does it also is part of my motivation for coming home and hopefully having an opportunity to continue my public service in this way and that's because i believe civic discourse in this country has deteriorated greatly i think there's a, actually a partisan slant to this i think we democrats win when the debate is kept to the substance and the policies and is not ad hominem one of the things i find uh, just completely repugnant about Washington, D.C., is how easy it is for people to slip into ad hominem arguments. Uh, there are rules against impugning the motives of fellow members in the state legislature. I will enforce them strictly. We win when it's about the substance. And I think increased civility, increased sense of fairness, earns trust. You can not affect the tone and the tenor of the body, and it is a part of my motivation. Hey, thank you. Uh, Robert. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm interviewing all these lieutenant governor candidates as if you might well be our next governor. Uh, you know, who knows who wins the presidential election, hopefully Biden and our own governor may wind up uh, joining his administration. Uh, I noticed that our current governor, Jay Inslee, took the no fossil fuels pledge. I looked on the website, I didn't see your name there as having taken that pledge. Is that a pledge you'd be willing to take? No money from fossil fuel companies or PACs. Thank you so much for asking. One of my opponents is making a big deal out of this. And I have to tell you, I think it's pretty cheeky because just last December, he took money from a lobbyist for one of the biggest oil companies in the world and then transferred that money to his campaign. So when he gives his money back, then it seems to me we can have a reasonable discussion about who's committed to fossil fuel reduction. Look, the fact of the matter is, I don't recall ever getting a dime from oil companies. I know I've never solicited them. And I've seconds. said to you now, not once, but twice, where I put my money where my mouth is on fossil fuel reduction legislation. And that's why environmentalists like Martha Consgard and uh, Stephanie Soline and Dennis McLaren and Jay Manning, the former director of the State Department of Ecology, who've worked with me Ten for seconds. years and know my environmental values are supporting my campaign. Great, thank you. Uh, Mackenzie. Yes, uh, so kind of a follow up to that for campaign donations. While this one is not um, involved with the fossil fuel company, uh, just one that kind of jumped out on me that I've noticed you've got a donation from for this campaign is from the, uh, the Vote Sane Pack. And uh, one thing that I noticed by digging into them a little bit is this year for his campaign, uh, they've donated over $100,000 to Mitch McConnell, who I think most of us would probably agree is uh, making things worse 
for the country as a whole. So I was wondering if that rubs you the wrong way at all, that that is something that they have done, and would you perhaps consider uh, a return of that donation? McKinsey, I don't have a contribution from Vote Same Pack. I'm 100% of my donations in my campaign for Lieutenant Governor thus far, 100% are from individuals. There's no corporate PAC money, unlike my opponents, uh, and 100% of it is from individuals. I have no idea what you're referring to. I've personally raised all that money. There is no vote same PAC money in my campaign. Okay, uh, I could be mistaken on that. I thought I saw a donation of 43,000 between individuals and the PAC as well from, I think, um, votes, um, whichever one I looked at. But if I'm mistaken on that, I apologize for sure. No problem. I think it was open secrets is where I found that actually. I, 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 maybe in one of my congressional campaigns, but I'm telling you in the Lieutenant Governor campaign, 100% of my donations are thus far from individuals. Okay, yeah, and I made sure to clarify. I'm, I'm very proud of that, actually. Great, uh, Alice. Um, so I am wondering, obviously, um, one of the worst parts about this current administration, um, uh, federal administration, um, is the way they've treated undocumented immigrants and just the in immigrant community at large. Um, what do you think you would be able to do, um, either as the governor or as the lieutenant governor, to um, protect undocumented uh members of our community. Um, and also, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on um, the issue of detention centers in Washington state and how we can make them also treat undocumented people better. So I think, I think it's important to understand what tools and levers the lieutenant governor does have and should bring to bear on this. First of all, they also by tradition chair the Senate Rules Committee and have a vote. So I would vote in accordance with those values that you and I share. Uh, secondly, they also have this incredible bully pulpit to speak up and speak out on behalf of, uh, of, of people who do not have documents and the immigration issue. I, again, I walk my talk throughout my time in Congress. I have supported uh, reforming the immigration system, uh, taking care of the DACA issue, which I just find incredible that we haven't done that for dreamers yet. And in each and every instance have been not just a, a reliable vote, but frankly, a co-sponsor of that legislation. As it relates to private profit detention That's centers, nice. I don't much like them at all. There's one just outside my district, I might add. Great, thank you. Um, and we are at time, that went very fast. Um, would you like to give a one minute uh, wrap up? You know, I, we gotta deal with this governor thing. Uh, give me a little attitude here, please. I made clear at the time of my announcement that I was very ready to be governor should the what ifs that you described take place. I've been as close to being governor as anybody could be humanly without being governor when I was chief of staff to a governor. If that were to happen, I would embrace my duty, I would do my duty. But I also made it clear that I would not stand for reelection. Uh, funny thing for me to say, but I think it's getting time to turn the reins over to another generation of young leaders that are coming up in this state. I would not run for re-election as governor, although I'm ready to be governor. And I just wanted to clarify that because I'm running for lieutenant governor because I want to be lieutenant governor. I'm not running because I want to be governor. And I hope you will consider being a part of our effort and uh, the individuals I mentioned. In the first five days of our campaign, we were endorsed by more than 220 local and state and tribal elected officials. Uh, we got a lot of momentum here. Fundraising from individuals, McKinsey, is going very, very well. And I would be so deeply honored if the 36th District were to be a part of it. And I thank you so very, very deeply for the opportunity to talk with you this evening. Great. Thanks. Thank you.